things that I have to go over. Tonight's meeting is being recorded for RCTV live, Comcast Channel 22 or Verizon Channel 33. The videography for tonight's meeting is Niles, or you can check with www.rctv.org for more information or replay times. That out of the way. Um, the Zoning Board of Appeals will hold a continuance of a public hearing in the community rooms at the Reading Public Library, 64 Middlesex Avenue in Reading, Mass., on Wednesday, July 18th at 7 p.m. On the petitioner of Lakeview, Eaton Lakeview De uh, Development LLC, who seeks a comprehensive permit to develop 120 units of rental housing on 4.33 acres of land uh, that is partially in residential zone and partially in the industrial zone under Masters General Laws 40B Section 20 through 23, with waivers from zoning requirements on the property comprising six parcels known as, and I'll just bypass that, we've already been here uh, for a while. Just for interest sakes, how many people attended the May 2nd meeting? And of the people who attended the May 2nd meeting, how many people attended the first meeting? The same people. Good, great. Uh, we've kind of dwindled a little bit, but um, we're still moving on. Um, usually, our our procedure, the board's procedure, is uh, to open the public hearing, um, allow the individual, the petitioner in this case, um, to present uh, their proposal. The board then reacts to that, asks questions, and so forth. And then the latter part of it, we do the public comment section. Um, it's extremely important this evening to get a couple of major issues on the public record. One being the changes, which we're going to see shortly, and the other one is the peer review and the traffic. Um, we've allotted some time to do that, but I'm going to reverse things just a little bit with, with the okay of the board, and that is I'm going to ask for public comment first relative to what we've done so far. I do not want any public comment on what is going to be presented because it's not on the record yet. So I would ask anybody who has input or would like to have input on the public comment section uh, to come up and do that right now. Please state your name and your address if you wish to do so. I just want to say something about our collaboration with the teams that forward looking. Is that okay? I'm trying to figure out how to do that. can you use the microphone? Yes. Yeah. Okay. about what the development team will be presenting. Uh, but I want to say we've been meeting with them several times. We have follow-up conversations. And I want to actually thank the board and the town staff for being patient and uh, allowing us uh, those negotiations to uh, go through and also allowing us to be active participants in shaping the project. We know it's unusual. We appreciate that. So I want also to say that initially when we started, uh, we expected a very adversarial process because it's typical for 40 bis And we were very pleasantly surprised that our comments, our concerns were taken into account and the team made a good effort to address most of them. So specifically, we are happy about the way they address the height, the transition to the neighborhood, Sorry about the details, townhouses for sale, everybody's thrilled about that. Um, also the design, we've been showing uh, the board inspired design. I'm very happy to say the new design, we see it as inspired. So our compliments to the team uh, on that. Uh, then I want also to give credit to Guy Manielu who is the lead, uh, the lead on the project because the, 
he, he had the vision and he saw the potential of the site that was ready to make a dramatic change to the project and uh, for the better. It's a much more appealing project now for us. And Guy is a neighbor and I have come to believe he wants to do the right thing for the neighborhood. So thank you, Guy, for that. And lastly about the traffic study, like we are very um, happy with the uh, excellent uh, comments that uh, the reviewer gave to our comments in the neighborhood uh, response letter. And we just hope that going forward the process will continue being collaborative and we hope that whatever happens with the outstanding issues like the labor intersection, um, the opinion, the input of the community will be taken into account going forward. So for us, it has been a very positive experience so far. I hope this continues. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Boyan. <coughs> Is there any anybody else who wishes to make a comment before we start? You might want to mention there still be time afterwards for a comment. Well, yeah. the oh. reason I'm doing this now is because we've got a lot of presentation to, to take care of tonight. I don't know how much time we're going to have. The library closes at 9 o'clock. We've got a slight extension on that, but we've got to be out of here before 9.45. So knowing that that's going to happen, we also need to set up the next meeting, and the next meeting we cannot afford to wait another 60 days or so to have that meeting. We need to move a little faster because our window of opportunity, it seems like a long time away, February of 1990, February of 2019, uh, but it's not that far away when you figure out all the paperwork that has to be done, everything signed off on. So we want to make sure that that is all done. So at the end of the meeting, normally we open it up for community input. I'm doing it right now so that we don't leave somebody without comment at the present. We do have a lot to get on the record tonight, though. So I've set up some tentative times. Um, I've set basically uh, up about an hour and 15 minutes for our first presentation, which will be um, Eden Lakeview Development LLC, to present that which they have brought in on the 28th of June uh, as a revision to the original plan that uh, we all have seen. And if you're here for the May 2nd, you were there as we started the presentation on that. So I'm just going to turn it over to Ted Brignante. Ted. Ted. <laughs> Ted. <laughs> Thank you. Andrew, can we get you to help us with the Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is this microphone on? No. Uh, you have to use the one over there. No, that's the that's for cable. Drag the big one over, and that you can use that one. There you go. Getting ready. Uh, good evening. Uh, public comment. Everyone hear me all right? Just it. Good. Uh, my name is Ted Regnante, and I'm the attorney for the project. And with me is Jesse Shoma, my associate, and uh, other members of the team I'll be introducing in a minute. Uh, at the inception, however, I would like to say that we have very much appreciated. Uh, the work and the effort that Boreana has put into this, not only Boreana, but uh, all the members of, of her group. Our meetings have been extremely constructive. Uh, the suggestions that <coughs> Boreana and her group have made uh, have been excellent, uh, uh, both from a technical point of view and from a point of view of working together to come up with a project that is a win-win for everything. So I wanted to reiterate that and, and again make the commitment to Boreana and her group that we will continue to work with you as we work through this entire process, uh, including when we get together, uh, hopefully at the end, to draft a, a, a decision. 
What I'd like to do now is give you some background and go through a chart with you in a few minutes so that everyone here can understand the changes that have taken place as a result of the workshop meetings that we've had with Oriana and with the town officials. But first of all, let me kind of put everything in, in perspective as to what, it, what has transpired here in terms of the number of units. In 2016 and 17, we approached the town with a proposal to develop two adjacent parcels located on the corner of Lakeview Avenue and Eaton Street, and Eaton Street near the Walker's Brook Drive Shopping Center. Initial conversations with the town focused on ways to increase the number of affordable units in order to limit the town's exposure to 40B projects. We worked on a number of layout plans for as many as 300 units. After discussing a number of proposals, the developer filed with Mass Housing for a project eligibility letter for 160 apartment units. Mass Housing issued a project eligibility letter approving the 160 units in October of 2017. We then made further changes, reducing it to 120. In January of 2018, we filed for approval for a 120 unit plan with the ZBA. In connection with the filing, we agreed to proceed subject to the town's right to invoke safe harbor under Chapter 40B. And we held hearings in February and in March. At those hearings, a consensus emerged among the residents of the neighborhood, led by Boreana's group, that the project was too large for the location. Based on these concerns, the development team met with members of the group of concerned neighbors and members of the town planning staff to work on ways that the project could be improved. We took the comments to heart and went back to the drawing board. On the revised proposal, the 40-unit apartment building on Eaton Street has been replaced with 12 low-rise townhouse-style condominium ownership units. That is not rental, but ownership units. The two 40-unit buildings on Lakeview Avenue have been replaced with two low-rise 12-unit buildings at the front of the lot and one mid-rise 50-unit building at the rear of the lot. All of the units on Lakeview will remain as rental units. Now I'd like to go through the chart that you see up on the board with you because it gives a good example of the comparison between the original project and the new project which uh, we are proposing this evening. So on the left side, uh, on the original January development plan, we had 120 units. We now have 12 condominium uh, ownership units, and I wanna again stress the ownership units because uh, we felt, and at the suggestion of Oriana's group, that there would be more identity with the town with ownership rather than rental. So those units will be ownership units, 12 units. There'll be 74 rental units for a total of 86 units rather than the 120 units originally proposed. That is a 28% reduction. On the original development, we had three four-story buildings with parking below, giving the appearance of four and a half stories at the street level and five stories from the rear. Now, with regard to the condo units on, we on Eaton Street, we have 12 townhouse-style units in two, in two four-unit buildings and two two-unit buildings presenting a two-and-a-half story at street level with a mansard roof to reduce massing with parking below. 
and the architect will go into that in more detail in a few minutes. The low-rise apartments on Lakeview are two buildings presenting two and a half stories at street level with a mansard roof to reduce the massing with no parking below. And the mid-rise apartments is a one-story building with no parking below. Originally, the building height in building number one was 50 over 50 feet. Now the condominium units are 31 feet, six inches. The 48 uh, buildings two and three were 48 feet. Now the low-rise building on, Lake, on Lakeview is 26 and the mid-rise 46. So a substantial reduction in not only number of units, but massing and height of buildings. The original building architecture was three identical 40-unit buildings with four residential levels above podium parking. The condos are now low-rise mansard and gable-rooted structures, roof structures, designed, as was suggested, to transition from the single-family houses north of the project. The low-rise apartments on Lakeview are contemporary style, low-rise, multi-family buildings and continue the transition started with the condominium buildings. And the mid-rise buildings behind the low-rise buildings complete a transition to multi-family residences. This building will also provide screening for the shopping center behind it. Originally, there were 181 spaces in podium levels under each building. Now, we have 135 total spaces, <coughs> approximately 1.7 per unit. Eaton Street will have 19 well, the garage spaces. Black Honda Accord with the library driveway comes with your vehicle. Thank you. Okay. Uh, five surface spaces and 19 garage for a total of 24. So there'll be two per unit of those ownership units. Lakeview Avenue will have 111 surface spaces, approximately one and a half per unit, including 10 spaces that are proposed to be banked for future construction if they prove necessary to accommodate parking demand. Until then, left is open space. Again, this was a suggestion of the neighborhood group, what we could do uh, to create more open space. So we've done that. Chris will show you that on the plan, but we're banking it so that if in the future we, we needed more parking, it would be available. In the meantime, we don't think it will be agreeing with, with the neighborhood group, so it will remain as green space. Uh, with regard to the affordable units, 77 units will be available in a new proposal on the town's inventory. That is three condos, because when you have ownership, you can only count those units that are affordable. <coughs> that will be 25% of the 12 or three. Whereas on the uh, rentals, you can count all of them. So that will be the 74. That is the two 12-unit buildings and the 50-foot building to the rear. There was one other thing that was brought to our attention that the group felt that having access and egress on the driveway on Eaton Street could present problems. Our traffic survey uh, indicated that it, that was not the case, but what we are willing to offer is to make that entrance, and Chris can show this to you in more detail, an entrance only, so no exiting from there, so that the uh, concern that the neighborhood, ha neighborhood has about taking a turn coming out of there will be eliminated, and still the fire department will have the availability to come out that way. So uh, we have shown that, Chris will go into it uh, in, in more detail. So that's basically uh, an overview of what we propose. Uh, and I think what probably makes sense is for us to go into it now in more detail. First, we'll hear from Chris, and then we'll hear from the architect. Uh, thank 
think that uh, members of the public and, and the CBA, Chris Sporadis, a professional civil engineer from the Engineering and Survey Office of Williams and Sporadis in Middleton. And I'm going to go into the site plan changes in a little bit more detail. Uh, we provided a, a detailed a summary of plan changes in a narrative form to the Zoning Board of Appeals as part of our site plan submittal. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to do now is just go through uh, the site plan changes in just a, just a little bit more detail. And you know we have uh, we have two separate uh, building lots uh, that, are, that make up the project, and we refer to them as the Eaton Street lot and uh, the Lakeview Avenue lot. This is a, just a quick overview. Uh, we've, uh, we've seen this uh, uh, this presentation plan before. It's an aerial uh, neighborhood overlay uh, with the proposed uh, reconfiguration of the project. Uh, and you can see uh, this is the Lakeview Avenue lot and the Eaton Street lot. We are proposing to change the configuration of the units on the Eaton Street lot, eliminating the one four-unit building and replacing it with 12 townhouse style buildings. And similarly, we have changes across the street on the Lakeview Avenue lot where we previously had two 40-unit buildings. Now we are proposing uh, three buildings and a little bit of a different configuration. Uh, the two 12-unit buildings are buildings one and two out front, and then building three in the back. Uh, the two buildings out front each contain 12 units, and the larger building out back uh, contains the balance of uh, 50 additional uh, rental units. What uh, this new configuration has allowed us to do is to provide for uh, that transition, if you will, a more uh, gradual transition uh, from the single family homes uh, in the surrounding um, uh, neighborhoods, uh, including down um, Eaton Street uh, and some of the other, uh, some of the other intersecting streets down here, which are essentially, for the most part, single family homes. Now we're providing a transition that includes some townhouse style units, and these are ownership units. And then as we cross the street, uh, we're transitioning to two mid-rise buildings. Uh, as Attorney Rignanti mentioned, uh, they don't sit up quite as high as uh, the building out back. Uh, and so it's sort of a ramping up effect uh, where we have uh, the lowest buildings uh, closest to the neighborhood uh, where the single family homes are located. And then as we cross the street, we have uh, two uh, low-rise apartment buildings and then a larger one in back. Uh, and this is not uh, uh, terribly different in terms of use than the existing um, Lakeview apartment project uh, next door to us here. Let's go to the, uh, to the next slide, Jesse. This is just a little bit of a, uh, of a blow up, uh, including uh, some aerials uh, that show the existing conditions. Uh, we've seen um, uh, these uh, aerial images before. Uh, blowing up uh, the project out of this area, you can see uh, the configuration in a little bit more detail. Uh, it was still very important to us uh, to maintain a circular flow of traffic uh, through both of the sites. So as you know, in the existing condition, Lakeview Avenue uh, comes down to the end here, and it's a left-hand turn on Eaton Street, and the pavement ends about here. And so our proposal uh, is going uh, to improve uh, this section of Lakeview Avenue, essentially extending uh, the roadway uh, in this fashion. And this is going to allow us to have a circular flow of traffic around the apartment lot on Lakeview, and then in a similar fashion, the, town, the townhouse development on the uh, Eaton Street lot. Now, as we uh, as I go uh, into more detail here, we're going to start off uh, talking about uh, the, uh, the the site details on the Eaton Street lot. Chris, uh, can you hold the microphone? Oh, sure. Okay. Yes. Close that a little closer. How's that? Is that better? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay, so um, on the uh, on our site plan set, uh, uh, the first couple of sheets are uh, include our existing conditions uh, plans, and as we uh, as we go through these couple of sheets, uh, Jesse, uh, you'll quickly come upon um, one of our layout uh, one of our layout sheets that's similar in nature to the um, to the colored uh, rendering plan here. Can we go forward a little bit here? I'll tell you when to stop here. 
All right, let's start, uh, let's start here. Uh, this is the Eaton Street, uh, the Eaton Street lot, and uh, you can also see the color, uh, the color rendering version uh, just over on the other side of the room. I'm going to pull that just a little bit closer. Trainer Dante mentioned, and I'm gonna I'm gonna refer to the to the color one here. It's a little bit easier. Um, it's a little bit easier to read it with the color. Uh, there are four proposed buildings now on um, the project. There are two four-unit buildings uh, that are located um, centrally on the lot here and back here, and then we have two smaller two-unit buildings or duplexes on the ends. And that uh, those four buildings make up the make up the 12 um, the 12 units on the Eaton Street lot. As far as parking is concerned, each of the, uh, underneath the buildings, uh, we are providing garage spaces. So there are a total of 19 garage spaces and then five surface parking spaces. Uh, the surface parking spaces are um, located on either side of the four unit building uh, on the back side of the property. Uh, there are a few spaces uh, on this side of the property and a couple of spaces on, on this side of the existing uh, the proposed four unit building. <coughs> That provides us uh, with a total of 24 spaces and a parking ratio of two parking spaces for each unit. The traffic pattern changes that we, uh, that Attorney Rignanti alluded to just a few minutes ago, um, work out like this, uh, and they're in a direct response to uh, the neighborhood comment uh, that concerns uh, vehicles exiting uh, the Eaton Street lot property out onto Eaton Street. At this location here, our previous plan provided for two-way traffic, uh, so folks have, could come into the site and come out. Uh, and there was a concern raised uh, that as a vehicle exited the site, that there may not, uh, that it may provide for um, too many conflicts with cars that were coming uh, down Eaton Street in this direction. Uh, there is a little bit of a, of a hill a little bit further up the street, as many of the neighbors are familiar with. Uh, as Attorney Rignanti mentioned, our traffic study uh, clearly um, indicated that uh, there, there is safe site distance available for, uh, for a vehicle exiting at this location based on uh, not only the observed speeds during the speed study, uh, but also based on the posted speed limit. Uh, so there was available site distance in both directions. Uh, but what we decided to do is we decided to close uh, or limit the access uh, into the property at this location by making it entrance only. And by making an entrance only, it allowed us, uh, uh, number one, to reduce the width of this driveway from 24 feet uh, to 18 feet, because you don't need as much width uh, for uh, a single lane of traffic. Uh, and that limits the, um, uh, the turning movements uh, onto Eaton Street at this location. Folks can still come in and turn into the site in each direction, uh, but folks will not be able to come out. It'll be designated one way. What we were able to do um, with the uh, reconfiguration here, we were still able to prove that we have the ability to, uh, to bring in the, uh, the town's um, largest fire apparatus uh, and, and to make this movement, even though this section is only one way. Maintaining uh, two access points and a circular flow pattern was very important to public safety officials, uh, as we found out during mul our multiple uh, department review team meetings uh, that, we had, that we've had with the town. Another change uh, to the plan uh, is uh, uh, as a result of uh, feedback from the neighborhood group uh, was the, uh, the moving, if you will, or reevaluation of where uh, the proposed dumpsters, uh, the proposed dumpster location is on the Eaton Street lot. So I'll, I'll point back over here. So the proposed dumpster location uh, was always um, proposed on, on this end of the site, on the north end of the site. And what we were able to do uh, with the reduction in the width of the driveway coming in, uh, we were able to shift uh, this proposed dumpster location a little bit further south uh, to get it a little bit further away uh, from uh, this neighboring um, property, uh, which is uh, 114 Eaton Street. We also evaluated other locations 
on the um, on the lot uh, towards, uh, let's say, down at this end. Uh, but uh, to make the, uh, the movement with our, our trash truck, for example, here or in any other location, uh, we still kept coming back um, to the side being more favorable. And so we are, we did move it a little bit. Uh, we are going to provide uh, screening, of course, for the dumpster. And as you'll see uh, in a moment, our landscaping plan also provides uh, for uh, a visual screening here with uh, proposed tree plantings along the property line between the Eden Street property and the number 114. Other notable uh, points, uh, even uh, we've, re we've reduced, of course, the, um, the number of units uh, here on this lot. Uh, the height of the buildings are much less, uh, and our architectural team will go into some of those details in a little bit, uh, a little bit more detail. Uh, but we're still maintaining a 25-foot uh, uh, no disturb or honoring, if you will, uh, the Local Conservation Commission's Zone of Natural Vegetation, which extends 25 feet from the wetland. And we're also honoring uh, the local uh, bylaw uh, under the CONCOM's local bylaw uh, with regard to a 50-foot setback to buildings from the wetland. Uh, we're still honoring that as well on the Eaton Street lot. In terms of stormwater management, our approach remains the same. Uh, and I'll, I'll go back over to our colored plan. Uh, stormwater uh, is being handled uh, in the same way that it was on previous plans. It is being collected across the paved surfaces and from the roofs of the new structures uh, through a series of uh, deep sump catch basins and drain manholes under the ground. And then uh, that is being collected in a, in a central location under the parking lot here in a series of plastic chambers that are located under the ground. Uh, the plastic chambers are uh, rect uh, rectangular in fashion here. Uh, they stack up nicely, one next to the other, and they're surrounded by um, washed crushed stone underneath and on the sides. And as we have various storm events, uh, the size of the underground plastic chambers allow us to hold the water and release it slowly uh, through our outlet control structure, which is located on the downstream end of the stormwater management area. And then uh, it discharges on the Eaton Street lot at this location here. For smaller storms, including the two year and the 10 year, uh, storm events, uh, all of the water is contained within the underground um, structures and, and our uh, stormwater calculations show that it's able to infiltrate into the ground nicely. Uh, you have to remember, um, uh, because we are required uh, to meet uh, DEP stormwater management standards and regulations, uh, this underground infiltration system, uh, the bottom of it is set four feet above uh, what was determined to be the estimated seasonal high groundwater table in the spring. Uh, and so it affords a nice distance uh, from the bottom of the chambers to the high groundwater in the spring uh, so that we know that it's gonna infiltrate uh, the way that it's been uh, designed uh, based on the test holes uh, and the soil texture that we observed in the field. In terms of other utilities uh, and services, uh, these units are uh, proposed to be uh, for sale. And um, as townhouse units, we have the ability in this case to connect individual uh, water service connections from Eden Street right to each of the units that face Eden Street. And then we'll have another water line uh, that'll come into the site in this fashion and come across the front of these units. And each unit will have its own water service. Similarly, each of the units will have its own sewer service, and we'll be able to accomplish that um, by collecting uh, uh, the sewer um, from each of the units uh, in a sewer collection pipe uh, that'll then be directed to uh, an extension of the sewer on Lakeview, uh, and we'll be able to flow by gravity um, into the town's sewer collection system. The four units across the back, which are, are units nine through 12, are a little bit lower uh, on the site, and as such, uh, we're gonna have to provide uh, for a small lift station for the uh, storage, so across the back of these uh, units will be a sewer collection pipe uh, to a small pump chamber uh, that'll pump up to a sewer manhole before uh, flowing by gravity, uh, again, into the sewer extension out on Lakeview Avenue. Our landscaping plan for the Eaton Street lot was also updated. 
and uh, our, um, uh, the table, if you will, on the, um, we can flip to the other one, uh, Jesse, real quick. Um, there's a summary table on the second landscaping sheet. Uh, I'll, we'll talk about, this is the Lakeview Avenue, lot. we'll go there in a minute. Uh, but our table of landscaping here is separated into uh, shade trees, ornamental trees, evergreen trees, flowering shrubs, and various ground cover, including grasses and perennials. Um, so if we go back to the other sheet, uh, the landscaping plan for the Eaton Street lot emphasizes um, uh, almost all our efforts on uh, planting additional trees, and it's a combination of shade trees, evergreen trees, and ornamental trees uh, throughout the site, and that's detailed on this plan. In addition, uh, I'll point out our row of evergreen plantings here, a dark American green arbor vitae, uh, that we're still proposing uh, to provide some additional visual screening between our townhouse project on the Eaton Street lot uh, and the neighbor here at number 114. This plan also uh, provides for and shows uh, calls out various areas for snow storage that we've made available. Uh, there are some areas in and around uh, the dumpster and, and various other locations on this lot. I won't go into detail on the, on the lighting plan, uh, but the lighting plan, of course, was also updated uh, to, uh, to uh, reflect the changes in the type of building. Uh, there's very minimal parking lot lighting now. Uh, we're able to do almost all of, the, all of the lighting from the units themselves. And our lighting photometric plan uh, shows uh, our uh, lumen values that are cast by the various fixtures. We have a software program uh, that uh, we can plug in specific information on light fixtures and uh, values of um, uh, bulbs in our LED light fixtures. Uh, and uh, this plan uh, shows the town and folks that are reviewing it uh, that we're not uh, spilling light uh, in an inappropriate way uh, across any of our lot lines and that we're providing uh, a safe light level um, on the property so that when folks come out at night, uh, they can safely walk to their vehicles. Uh, so now I'd like to just move over to, across the street uh, to the Lakeview Avenue lot, uh, just to go into a little bit more detail on uh, the new layout. We have a similar circular traffic pattern, of course, and we are still maintaining uh, two-way traffic all the way around uh, the Eaton Street lot. And so folks will be able to come into the project if they're traveling down Lakeview and uh, take a right into the project. Uh, this is a, a two-way traffic and you'll be able to drive all the way around the building and come back out this end. Uh, and if uh, folks that are leaving in the morning, uh, they have uh, several options, um, various options, I should say, uh, heading down Eaton Street in this direction or down Lakeview uh, to make their way out to surrounding streets. This plan is quite different in terms of parking and parking layout uh, because all the surface parking uh, that's proposed on the Lakeview Avenue lot now is laid out on the surface. Uh, this is our apartment lot, and uh, you can see our buildings one and two, uh, the two 12-unit buildings, and our building three, which is the 50-unit building. Uh, we were able to cut down the height of these structures by moving the parking uh, away from the buildings uh, out onto the surface. Uh, Attorney Rignante uh, summarized uh, the parking count on this lot, we have 101 parking spaces on the surface proposed uh, in and around uh, the site on all three sides. And then I'll draw your attention uh, to um, the land banked uh, park, small parking lot that we're proposing to keep uh, as a green space uh, because we don't believe uh, that uh, these spaces are needed at this time. And this is a small area here. It's shown as a small parking area, but the lines are dashed. Uh, and this is that area here where we have 10 proposed parking spaces, but for future use only. Uh, and so uh, looking at our, our color rendering here, you can see that this uh, area here is, is colored in green, uh, representing that we, uh, we are not going to be building this, but if the need arises in the future, uh, the town uh, uh, could uh, require us uh, uh, to build that out if the need were to arise. This allows us to uh, have a little bit more greenscape along uh, along the Lakeview um, frontage of the Lakeview lot. So I can continue on my color rendering. <laughs> okay. 
Attorney Rignante uh, obviously uh, uh, explained um, uh, the stories and the number of units uh, and the configuration on the Lakeview Avenue lot. Once again, uh, similar uh, similar to the Eaton Street lot, we are honoring uh, the setback uh, to the wetland uh, that borders um, along the uh, canal um, back along uh, this property line and along this property line. We're maintaining a 25-foot zone of natural vegetation, uh, which complies with the local zoning, um, non-zoning wetlands bylaw. Similarly, uh, we are not proposing any buildings within 50 feet of the local, uh, uh, excuse me, of the, of the wetland, which is also in compliance with the local bylaw. From a stormwater standpoint, our approach again uh, remains the same on the Lakeview Avenue parcel. Our focus is on infiltration, and with um, with the new um, requirements under the MS4 um, guidelines uh, that have come down from the federal government and uh, from uh, the state level, uh, there's a big focus now on uh, providing and selecting uh, stormwater structures that provide for removal of certain contaminants of concern, and they can vary from town to town. In Reading, uh, what, we, what uh, the town has found out, uh, that the focus is going to be on helping uh, remove additional amounts of phosphorus. And one of the best ways to do that is with infiltration type stormwater management areas. And so uh, on the Lakeview Avenue lot, we have two areas where we're proposing underground infiltration. Uh, there's one um, on the west side of the property here. And then similarly, we have a second uh, infiltration um, area on uh, in the southeast corner here. They work very similar uh, to the setup on the Eaton Street lot, whereas water is collected in the paved areas through a series of best management practices, including deep sump catch basins, uh, sediment, sediment trap um, structures before uh, going into uh, one of the two infiltration basins. And again, uh, these are designed uh, to uh, hold uh, the water and then contain it and hold it back and release it uh, slowly uh, back to the receiving waters, which of course are the wetlands that border Walker's Brook. I didn't mention this on the Eat Street lot, uh, but we will, obviously we, we will be filing uh, this uh, app, uh, an application with the Conservation Commission uh, because we are proposing work within 100 feet of a bordering vegetative wetland. We also have uh, some work uh, within land, uh, bordering land subject to flooding, uh, and this will be reviewed in detail uh, by the Conservation Commission as part of a notice of intent filing, which is another public hearing process similar uh, to the one here in front of the ZBA. For uh, additional and other utilities, uh, this uh, Lakeview Avenue parcel is a, uh, works a little bit differently uh, because we have three larger buildings. And so uh, water service connections will come in uh, from the existing water main on Lakeview Avenue, and each building will have its own water service. Uh, each building will have its own fire service. Uh, these buildings will all be um, sprinkled, of course. Um, in accordance with uh, the building code. And then each of the buildings will have its own uh, sewer service, uh, each of which can, uh, has the ability to flow by gravity into the sewer line extension at the end of Lakeview Avenue that we're proposing uh, to install. And again, uh, land, the landscaping plan has been updated for the Lakeview Avenue lot. And again, the focus uh, is on uh, tree plantings and flowering shrubs uh, and various ground cover. We have large courtyard areas on the Lakeview Avenue lot, which is a little bit different uh, than what we have available to us on the Eaton Street lot. And so there's a, there's a lot more opportunity to uh, provide for landscaping in these common areas in between the buildings. Our architectural team will, uh, will go into detail on on um, the layout of some of the sidewalks and how we're, the project is interconnected. Uh, so I won't go into that uh, in, in any detail at this time. Uh, but the dump, proposed dumpster locations on the, the Lakeview Avenue lot, there are two of them. Uh, one at each of the uh, back corners of the property, very similar to what we had presented to the ZBA before. This allows easy access uh, to, uh, to empty out 
um, our uh, recycling container and our municipal solid waste containers. Each of these locations will have, uh, will have one of each. And then this landscaping plan also calls out proposed snow storage areas at various locations. And of course, um, should, uh, should the need arise, uh, if the snow storage areas were to fill up on either one of these projects, uh, our snow uh, removal plan is such that it would be trucked off site uh, to, to an approved um, a snow storage area during the winter months. This layout um, uh, provided for um, uh, a little bit less of a green strip uh, between uh, the apartment project on this on the Lakeview Avenue lot and the Lakeview Apartments project. Uh, but there is still uh, a nice uh, screening available uh, between the two properties. Um, there's an existing uh, relatively new uh, six foot high stockage fence that runs along the entire property line that provides uh, separation and privacy from this proposed project uh, to the Lakeview uh, Avenue apartments here. And I think that uh, covers it. Uh, that's the end of my formal presentation. Um, uh, Ted, uh, at this time, do you want to move on to uh, the architectural? Yes, uh, Steve. Stephen Griffin Architects and uh, working as an associate with Curtis D. Benetto Architects on this project. Um, after the original design for this project um, was, was again, as we said a number of times, there were um, two uh, 40 unit building here on Lot B and two 40 unit buildings uh, here on uh, Lot A. Uh, after meeting with uh, the neighborhood, um, Association, uh, we worked hard with them to one change the style of the buildings uh, visually, and also to change the massing of the buildings to bring them down to scale uh, that was more appropriate uh, for the neighborhood. We have a okay. Um, so on the townhouse units, uh, each unit is a three bedroom bedroom unit. Uh, they have first floor. Uh, they have garage parking underneath on the basement level. They have first floor open a uh, floor plan with uh, kitchen, uh, living, living, dining, and living space combined. Uh, the second, the second floor is um, two bedrooms and a bath, and then the third floor is a um, master bedroom suite. Uh, the original buildings were uh, was a were flats, and they were. Um, it was a four-story, four and a half-story building. This is now cut down to a three-story building. And in appearance, um, when we go to the elevations, or do we have? Yes. Um, they're more townhouse, residential-type looking units. So um, the three, the three stories actually appears to be two and a half, like a house would. So the, you know, the upper floor, of the master bedroom suite, as you can see, is now hidden in the roof with dormers. So it, the appearance of the buildings now has, has grown, gone from four and a half down to two and a half uh, to be more consistent with the neighborhood and the, the housing around it. So this will start building up to the larger building. Um, also, in, in amongst the uh, talks with the neighborhood council, uh, we, there was a desire to go from more, a more traditional um, vocabulary to something that was um, mimicked it, um, but did it in a more contemporary way. So as you can see that the windows are not, are a little bit, uh, um, a little bit longer, a little bit more of them, and the trim is a little bit less. So it has a, it has a, a massing feel of a traditional building, but it also has a contemporary feel with the siding and the, uh, the trim boards. Um, all the buildings on the, on the project will be cement, um, cementitious board and panel and trim. Uh, the windows will be thermal braked windows. Um, it will be energy, energy efficient, um, up with the standards of the, of the codes in, in the state. Next. Which one do you want, Steve? Uh, let's go to the 12 unit buildings, please. So, 
so on the, on the site, and I'll have to point the site plan over here. So we were talking just recently with those townhouses right here on lot A. On lot B, um, the two this the 240 um, unit buildings that were four and a half stories. Um, we've changed them to these tw these two 12 unit buildings uh, that are again three stories but look two and a half. Again, consistent with the, the vocabulary and the height of the neighborhood. And then this back building is now up to four stories, which we'll show in, in a second. So essentially what we've been doing, what we've done is, is we created sort of a, a step up from a one and a half, two story, to two and a half story type of residential through our two and a half story and then jumping to the back to a four story. So we're essentially screening the larger building with these small, smaller height, um, peat residential type buildings that mimic the neighborhood. So the 12 unit building, which are these two right here, both of them have, this, again, the same vocabulary as the townhouses. Um, granted that the massing's a little bit wider because they're, they are a little bit larger um, buildings. The, these units are uh, one, and, one and two bedroom units, and these are flats. So there's three stories of, of building. Each story has two bedrooms and one bedroom flats. Now this jumps up to the building in the back, which is a 50 unit building. This building is, um, again, all flats. This is um, one, two, and three bedroom flats. Four stories, no underground parking. And this takes a, a contemporary um, vocabulary a little bit more um, forward and allows us to uh, have a little bit more windows, give the decks to the, the uh, occupants and um, essentially keep the height down as, as, as low as possible. Uh, the building also, this building also houses for the complete complex, a common space area, so a common entry, concierge, mail, um, common room with you know some common things like game room or um, coffee area, stuff like that. So this is sort of the, the main hub of this site here. So most, most of the um, activity on the site will occur in the middle, away from the sides of the of the of the you know neighboring people and the street. So it's inward looking uh, for the residents and outward looking from the guys from the outside. <coughs> do you want floor plans next or rendering, Steve? Uh, let's go. Yeah, we'll do the floor plans for this, and then we can do the renderings at the end, so they can see what it looks like. So this this is the basic floor plan for the 12 unit building um, and it repeats itself on all three floors and for both buildings. So essentially you have entry on either end on the sides, again away, keeping away from people being on the street side. You come in and there's two uh, egress stairs up, up the building and with units coming off of that main corridor. On the larger building, the 50 unit building, uh, there's a, this is the typical first floor, ground floor, and then this is the typical upper level floors. There's really, the only main difference between that is the entry, like I uh, explained earlier, the common area space is here that provides services for the com complex itself. Uh, the rest of it has entry, entry points on uh, through the stairwells in the back, main entrance in the back, another stairwell entrance here, and then the main entrance in the front. So again, everything is pulled away from the street so that it keeps the residents within the, within the complex and uh, keeps, keeps it uh, contained. Um, off of that, then you'll have the various units of, of one, two, and three bedrooms. And as you can see, when you get to the upper floor, the, the, these common spaces on the upper floor turn into units. So you gain a couple extra units through that process. Right. Next slide. Uh, Red, rendering is Yeah. <coughs> So this is the town, these are the townhomes on, um, on Lot B. And as you can see, uh, you know, they're two, two and a half stories, um, you know, entry on, on for the townhouses or up some stairs for grade. Uh, again, very traditional form in a, uh, rendered in a modern kind of contemporary way. Uh, color uh, allows it to break down the units, the buildings a little bit more to allow the um, uh, the appearance that they are more uh, residential uh, residential type buildings. 
as you can see, that, that same um, design uh, motif has, was carried across over to the two 12-unit buildings that are in the front of Lot A. And uh, again, in color and, and you know, big windows and um, scale to break down the buildings so that they are consistent with the neighborhood. And finally, in the back, behind those the two 12-unit buildings that you can kind of see here, is the is the main building, and that one has the 50 units and four stories, and it's a little bit more contemporary. Okay. Okay. Well, Mr. Chairman, that. Uh, <coughs> That's basically uh, engineering and, and architectural review of the new plans, and we're happy to answer any specific questions that the members, the DBA members have uh, with regard to those plans. Well, as we do, we just uh, go up and down the, the board to find out if there are people who have uh, individual questions. I can start out with a, a couple of them. Um, <coughs> because this is because this because this is a new uh, proposal or an adjusted proposal. Um, question is, uh, what are we looking for? Or what have you list looking for in terms of waivers that you're requesting? I'm not sure that you have gotten to that yeah, point we, yet. Uh, we haven't. Uh we haven't uh, made up a new list of waivers. We presented one with the original plan, but of course all that will change. And we didn't want to prepare the, the waivers until we've gotten the reaction of the board to move forward. But we, we, could, we could have that at the next meeting, uh, assuming the board is uh, satisfied with uh, the response that we're making. <coughs> but we would do that, but we don't have them tonight. <clears throat> Bob, do you have? Uh, I, I did. I, I had a couple of questions here. Uh, <clears throat> in your parking layouts, I saw that. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I uh, saw that you had no provisions for loading zones. Um, concerned with more with the rental buildings with loading zones, uh, people moving in, people moving out, then I am certainly the townhouse units uh, where they could park right there. I uh, was wondering if you'd like to comment on that in regards to loading zones. Maybe that's something you hadn't thought of yet. We have Chris. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sure, the question was with regard to, uh, to loading zones. And uh, what we've done, uh, what we anticipate uh, uh, being able to do is uh, if, uh, if a moving uh, vehicle needed to come in, uh, you know, temporarily, uh, that they would be um, that they would be parking in one of the one of the parking fields, uh, either uh, pre preferably in the back of the in the back of the building. Uh, if someone was moving into uh, one of the 12 unit buildings, uh, they would uh, again uh, it would be a temp temporary interruption, if you will, of, of parking. Um, we don't have a designated uh, location. Mm -hmm. uh, because of uh, the reduction in the number of units and not providing for uh, parking underneath the buildings, <laughs> our, um, our site uh, spread out a little bit. Um, it doesn't necessarily provide for dedicated loading, uh, but this is something that um, that could be handled by the management company um, easily. Uh, it happens um, in, in uh, many different locations, but there will be some uh, temporary, you know, taking out of the parking space. That's the way we're going to accomplish that. Okay, Chris, while you're up there, uh, what are your uh, aisle widths in the rental areas? Uh, are they for two way traffic? They are. Um, so on all three sides, we have 24 foot wide pavement. And then our parking spaces, of course, are, on, uh, I believe, are 9 by 18. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question I had, Chris, while you're up there. Sure. Uh, 
on that uh, lift station, the sewer lift station you had for the townhouses, is that envisioned to be part of the property management or will that be a town maintained lift station? Sure, so the proposal um, is to, uh, uh, across the back of the backs of uh, units nine through 12, uh, there'll be a, a, sewer, a sewer pipe that will flow by gravity uh, to a small pump station. That will be on the private property. And because uh, the 12 units are gonna be ownership, uh, this is gonna be, a uh, form of ownership is gonna be a condominium. And the condominium will be responsible for uh, maintenance of the pump station. Will there be a backup generator for that, for electrical power? So, um, you know, we haven't gotten that far yet. <laughs> yeah. uh, but um, it, it certainly, I'll, I'll write it down on my uh, yeah, list of yeah, things I to would, talk about with the team. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure it wouldn't need to be too large if it's just, uh, what, what, just handling uh, wastewater from four units. But uh, Right, so uh, yeah. just to let you know how, how that works, let's assume for a moment we, and there are still some septic systems in Reading. Yep. If it was uh, under the regulations of Title V, uh, the code tells us that um, they need to design pump stations uh, to provide for emergency storage of 24 hours okay. or provide uh, for a generator backup. So um, our experience, and uh, we have a similar situation on a, on a new subdivision that, we're, that we just got approved here in town um, on Main Street in the North Reading Town Line, and we have a similar pump station there. I'll, uh, I'm going to see what we did there, um, and uh, we'll get back to you. Okay. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, how's Bob? Uh, let's see. Oh, I was going to ask about the uh, dumpsters, uh, waste management. I saw you have them for the larger building and over at the townhouses, but the smaller buildings, it appeared that those residents would have to go all the way to the rear of the larger building? Or... <laughs> So that's, that's correct. Um, the way our, our layout is proposed uh, right now is that we want to isolate um, the, loca the locations uh, for, the, um, uh, for, the, for the trash removal, you know, to the, as far away from the units as possible. And so that's why those locations were chosen. Yeah. yeah. So they'll have a little, bit, a little bit more walking to do. Okay. Okay, that's a, just a comment. Let's see. Oh, I was going to ask, too, and I know maybe uh, Ted is the one on this one, in regards to Lakeview Avenue, uh, originally that was going to be improved to town standards. Is that still in the mix, that Lakeview Avenue? I, I know you're going to extend that. That but is still in the mix. It's going to be improved to town standards Correct. with sidewalks, widths, and then uh, hopefully be accepted as a town uh, way. Hopefully accepted as a public way. As a public way. Okay, thank you. Sidewalks on one side. And, yeah, very good. That's it for me, uh, Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah. I think this is a uh, very substantive change from what you started with uh, when we kicked this off in January uh, in a very positive way. I think it's, it's, it's put a lot of thought into this thing. But one of the things you haven't addressed tonight is the needs for people who might be elderly or disabled or special needs who might want to move into these this complex. We haven't even talked about that tonight. Okay. So the, qu the question was is to address the uh, elderly and handicapped. Yes. Um, all units uh, per mask or designed for mass code uh, have to be accessible, uh, have a percentage of accessible units, and also have to be handicapped uh, and ADA accessible. Right. So the, um, the townhouse units, uh, that's accomplished by just uh, the townhouse units accomplished just by, by having the uh, general entrance B is sort of like a regular home. So that, that, that kind of takes care of itself because it's more residential. The larger 12-unit building and the 50-unit building 
Um, on the 12 unit buildings, there's no elevator as you can see in the plan. However, the first floor unit, there, each building has first floor units that are uh, dedicated to handicap and ADA accessibility. Uh, and all corridors and door widths are provided and the units are designed to allow for change to those, to, you know, if someone moves in who has those uh, issues to deal with. On the 50 unit building, uh, the same thing applies with units being uh, changeable and uh, modifiable to ADA, but there's also an elevator in that building and those two built, the, those three buildings on that site have handicap access, i.e. on grade while going to the doors. So essentially, basically everybody is, uh, who has ADA issues or senior uh, issues can uh, access these buildings. Is the elevator right smack in the middle? Uh, yes, it is. Correct. Okay. On the back side. Yeah, correct. Yeah, correct. right there. Yeah. Okay. All right. There you go. I, uh, he just did. But. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, the only other comment I would make at this point is that when you when you downside this thing by about 28 percent of livable units, uh, that's also going to have an interesting effect on some of the other things that are bothering people, which is traffic and things like that. So I'd be interested in seeing what the impact of that might be on whoever presents the peer review of traffic. I don't have anything else. Yeah. <laughs> Our response in reducing the number of units came as a result of, number one, comments uh, from the neighborhood group, uh, and even more importantly, from you, you, your message was loud and clear that uh, the project that we presented was too dense. And we listened to you and, and, and the group, and that's why we res responded before. So we appreciate it. Uh, you know, forthright comments that you made in this sense. Eric. Uh, just two quick things. Um, I, I do think that you should put um, some designated uh, loading areas, or at least maybe, and I'm hoping for the next meeting, we can maybe have something submitted uh, like a draft operating manual, like how you're going to handle the, the snow removal, the you know trash schedule, um, and the loading if you want to address it in there would be terrific. Uh, that's all I'm going to say for now. I'll just defer any other comments after the uh, after the peer review presentation. So you'd like to see an operating manual for. Uh, snow and, and trash removal. Yeah, all the all the finer details. Now that it's kind sure. of coming into focus. Um, you know, those are always helpful to review, just so that we can be clear about the pump station, about what happens if we have a, a large snowstorm. How are we going to manage that for the people that are living there? It's not in the architecture. That's it. And that, by the way, is not a problem for my clients because they own many other units, so yes. they're doing this all the time. Great. Nick. I just want to get it. Button, button on the top. Is that the button? Yeah. I just want to say that uh, I definitely appreciate the land banking idea. I like that the parking ratios are not exorbitant and that there's an opportunity to increase the parking on the site. And definitely appreciate the height, the transition, the design, all the cooperation that's gone into it so far. And I think most importantly, most notably, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to create uh, home ownership units for low to moderate income households. I think that's a great feature that came out of um, this process. I don't have any questions, but I also do like to see uh, some type of loading zone or some type of plan in writing for loading, uh, drop off and pick up, and if there is some type of parking management plan in works, I mean, what would trigger the demand for that land banking? I'd be interested in doing that as well. Okay, we'll do that. Have it Great. Uh, for myself, um, tell me a little bit more about how we're going to delineate or separate the condo, which is lot A, from lot B. Is that at, at the time that um, the complex is completed? Because you're coming in right now 
with basically one parcel which is a, a composite of A and B, but A is going to be in essence, after it is sold off, it's going to be a, a condominium. So that's going to be separated out, and lot B is going to become the uh, rental unit, which we're going to get the uh, spaces uh, counting towards the affordable housing. So how is that going to work, Ted? <coughs> Uh, well, I'll work with the town council on this, but uh, because we have uh, two types of development, one ownership and one rental, it, it really will be two components. In fact, we'll have two regulatory agreements, one that will operate uh, on uh, with regard to the ownership and one that will operate with regard to the, to the rental units. Uh, and... and uh, We'll also have uh, a separate condominium organization that will be responsible for the, uh, uh, the common areas on the 12-unit building. And then uh, it'll be easier probably with regard to the rental because that will be owned by the developer mm -hmm. uh, in, in the ownership entity. So those are details that can be worked out, uh, but it, it will be bifurcated uh, in, in terms of the project. I preface that only because I was somewhat disappointed um, in the new proposal that you've done. Uh, in the previous, or the original proposal, there was a community center attached to it and it was on lot B. Um, we're talking about whether it's 86 units or 90 units or 100 units. We're talking about in additional to the neighborhood, we're talking about multiplying the neighborhood by two. So right now we probably have 100 homes, plus or minus, uh, in the neighborhood. And we're going to put in another project on a smaller piece of property. And we're going to create another 100 units. We're doubling it. Back there would be a perfect opportunity, and I like that. One of the things I really liked about the proposal was that there was going to be a community center, whatever you want to call it, um, but some place where people would be able to go. Um, in the condo area, um, that's not as important to me as an individual, as one member of the board, as it would be for the apartment uh, section of it. Um, when I ask you about the delineation or the breakdown of the, of the two lots, lot A and lot B right now are defined by the town with meets and bounds. Um, there is a um, retaining wall that you're proposing um, along lot A that runs into lot B. Um, and behind that, you have a 25 foot uh, uh, setback that goes up to greater than 35 feet setback. But that area between lot A and lot B was an extension of Lakeview Avenue. And I don't know where the extension of Lakeview Avenue, which is a paper street, uh, where that is, is, is added to lot A and lot B. My, my gut feeling when I looked at this was that would be a perfect area to put in a, perhaps a community center. I don't know about the, the area uh, relative to the conservation area. Um, I see the retaining wall uh, continues all the way down, uh, and that's buffering uh, the 35-foot setback from the uh, vegetation. Um, so my, my question is, um, <laughs> is there a possibility uh, you know, of something inclusion um, of a community center. We're using the green space in front, which 
uh, of lot B, uh, to me, that green space is wonderful if it's gonna stay as green space, if it's gonna be look, looked at for increased housing or something else later on. Uh, personally, I'm not necessarily in favor of that, but I'm trying to look at the whole project. So my, my we, we have no plans to put a building in that uh, land bank area. That That's remaining as green space unless we find out in the future that we need additional parking, which we don't in terms of the amount of parking that we have. But in terms of the first question that you raised about the community building, we have a community room, and perhaps you can talk about that for a minute. Yeah, so the, the inclusion of a community space and building from having it uh, the way it was designed before, which is sort of, it was more of a, it was more of a, I'll uh, go over here, guess I plan, just. A, yeah, yeah, right. So originally there was it was there was a little bit of a bump out here, um, and it was more visual, almost like a you know something separate from the project. It was always included as part of the complex and project. And essentially, we can go to the other spaces now. Essentially, what we've done is we brought it inside the building because before we did not have before instead of having more of this open space, which is actually more defined like this uh, in the building. Um, those were units, and that, that was pushed outward so that it was more visually a separate building. Now what we've done is we've, we've pulled it back in and given more green space back outside and brought those um, spaces towards the inside of the building. So it, granted, it looks a little small here, but this is, you know, th this right here is, is almost, you know, a little over 2,000 square feet of space just right there, and we haven't designed it. But essentially what there will be is there will be a number of rooms because not only would it, it's going to serve the complex more than it will the major community for most of the time. Um, there'll be, you know, meeting rooms for the for people. There'll be uh, rooms to rent. So if I'm if I'm living in this complex and I decide that I want to have a Super Bowl party, I go down to management, ask them to use the large room with the big TV and, and that holds 30 people. Um, that's sort of the idea of the of the of the space. Now, if if you know, the, the management company wants to allow a community meeting to happen there and to bring people in from the outside, then that's that they would be you know up to them to do that and to uh, manage that as well. And we don't see any need to have a, a community room for the 12 ownership units. That I, that I completely understand. When I looked at the plans, um, the uh, loan, blown up plans, I mean, the smaller ones were difficult to read, but it looks like those two community areas that you're talking about, uh, they're both about 24 by 26. So, so yeah, unless I, was, I miscalculated them. Yeah, no, so, yeah, so if I was, if you can see this right here, what I'm circling, that would be essentially a one bedroom unit, which is in the 1500 square foot range, give or take 1700 in that kind of ballpark. You can see that that's about that size, if not bigger. So it, it does bank itself up to that point. I thought that the uh, one bedroom uh, was listed at 780 square feet. Uh, right, right, okay. Yeah, yeah, correct, I'm sorry. But the two spaces, the two spaces together, I'm sorry. I, I, I was calculating this as being full. So yeah, so that would be about, about 7,800, this is about 7,800, so now you're up to the 15, 1,600 square feet that I was just talking about, yes. Okay. The other thing that has been designed there, Steve, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is in the uh, other area where the rental office is we have uh, a package concierge since more and more people are using Amazon <laughs> to get packages. We, we need to have a place where people can pick up their packages. So concerned. I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the other area, the other areas um, that I had concern about, I think was brought up by the other board members. We have in the past um, 40 Bs required some type of loading uh, loading zone, especially when we're talking apartments, because uh, people moving in, people moving out. You're talking about a substantial number of individuals moving on a regular basis when you're talking about roughly 70, 74, um, 74 rental spaces. The, the, the loading areas is not as critical on the condo side, 
on. It's we've done it in the past by using a combination of the parking areas, which I think uh, Chris had mentioned before, by moving the dumpster area back. We have some space there. Uh, we can easily put an extended um, loading zone on, on that. That's that's the easiest one to, to do, but. The bigger question is, what do you do with the uh, the three buildings, especially um, when you're looking at one point, basically 1.6 parking spaces per unit now? That's that's great. I think that's that's very achievable. Um, I'm wondering if um, I get I go back to my original thought. That space, the dead end, the the paper street, which is Lakeview extension between the two lots originally, who does that belong to? Uh, we have rights in that uh, because we own on both sides. You have rights. But my we question right is, to, uh, no, no, number one, I we, we own the uh, uh, both sides. Halfway into it, yes, so halfway into it. Right, the street. Yeah. I, I think. Uh, if I could interject, I, I know, and, and just from my experience, in, in, you know, as a civil engineer, if Lakeview is a private street, the town has no ownership values there. And Gene, if I'm wrong, correct me. Uh, so most likely, and I don't know for sure, because I haven't looked at property deeds, but most property deeds then would go to the center of the street as, as that private way. Uh, the ownership would go know. to the center mm -hmm. on, on that. So when that becomes a public street, it will be from uh, back of sidewalk to back of sidewalk generally is the, uh, the town will own that then. Once it gets down to that end of the property, I think that's something that the developer uh, is going to have to work out with the town. Who's going to own that, and how, how is that, you know, is going to work well, out? It that, would be all uh, part of the public way that we that would be turned over to the to the, right. to the town. Yeah. Gene, any input? Thank you. Um, I do have a number of comments. I'll try and be brief. Um, we made a comment, Andrew and I spent some time looking at the plans, and um, one of the comments was about snow storage, which I know we've talked about in the past. It looks very limited on the plan, and um, so I'm assuming that means you're going to be focusing more on snow removal. Um, but that's just one comment. Um, we also noted on the um, site plan you, on your parking tabulation you're referencing the zoning bylaw saying that it's 1.5 for lot a for 1.5 parking spaces per unit um, and you're referencing the apartment dwelling i think that wants to be changed to townhouse dwellings which is um, two spaces per unit you, you've provided the parking i think you just need to make that correction on the plan um, I have some concerns about the dumpster um, on the townhouses, um, how that's going to be enclosed, how that's going to operate, and I think somebody else already said about an ops plan for how things would work, but even visually, um, I'm a little bit concerned about that dumpster and, and would be interested in ways to soften that and make that work for the neighborhood. Um, I'm also interested in the materials for the guardrail and the retaining wall. I'm not really sure what you're calling out there. Um, I, I'm, I'm interested in seeing uh, a plan for overflow parking. I don't know where visitor parking goes. Um, and I'm also interested in the handicapped parking. I, I know um, there could be a, a bigger demand for uh, that in this type of a development. Uh, I made mean, somebody else already mentioned the loading zone and the deliveries. Um, the lighting, um, I know you said they were going to be mostly wall packs, but I'd be interested in seeing a fixture um, cut sheet so that we can understand that exactly and make sure that they are dark sky compliant. Um, with the landscaping, I noted there were only three trees along Eaton Street, and I wondered if, um, if that 
maybe could be looked at again. Um, six trees along Lakeview. Uh, I, I just the more trees, the better, obviously. Um, and then my other question was about the uh, 12 unit buildings. Those are three story buildings, correct? And I just want to understand why there's, if I'm reading the plans correctly, no elevator. Right, so, so essentially for, So, so the way the building code reads now, um, using the uh, IBC versus the old mass uh, ninth, eighth and ninth edition, um, is that the um, because there's only there's only four units essentially on a floor plate, you don't need to have an elevator as long to provide the access. And the way to get rid of the way to the elevator does not have to be there is to provide the accessible access apartment on the first floor. So essentially, both of those buildings have 88 units on the first floor, which is a percentage of the of the um, of the units themselves. So we needed one per building, and that right there takes care of the need for accessibility up up through the building. And then by code, because we only have four units, anything more than that, then you are required to, to go to the next level. That's why the, the larger building has it. You're referencing the building code. Correct. I'm asking about the handicap code. Right. Right, it's the first floor, right. So they, they, they go together. So with uh, mass AAV and ADA, um, because you have to, you determine how many, what the accessibility of units that you need. So we determine, all right, this needs one. You go back to the building code, it says, because of the floor plate, we want to try to eliminate the elevator because there's only four units, so we can do that. And then as long as you provide that number of units in that building, which is on the first floor, and those are accessible um, from the exterior, then and through the corridor, then you're all set to go. And Gene, with regard to the other issues that you've raised, they're good issues and, and we will respond to them. Uh, but they're, they're more in the detail and we yep. wanted to get, you know, a green light uh, uh, to proceed with this plan. But, you know, th those are all issues that we need to provide at the next meeting, assuming we're encouraged to move forward. As I said at the very beginning of the meeting, we have a lot of information to get on here. This was just a, comp well, what would we call it, a, an initial plan with, with missing some of the details, and it's not as complete as the initial plan that you gave us with the 120 units. Um, that, is, that is understood. We know that we must get more into this. This was... Uh, just a means of getting um, the basic information for this new proposal on the record so that we can move down the line. Um, unless there is uh, additional... Um, um, I don't know if it's on the front of peer review for architectural and engineering to do that at this point. Does it do next? Um, uh, no, but the, the next peer reviewers... Yes. Um, John, yeah, just a quick question to uh, quick question to the town, Gene. Uh, we have downsized the plan now. What does this do to uh, our, our, you might say, our safe harbor? Our, our, yeah, our safe harbor and our, uh, uh, you know, the amount of affordable housing we do have in town now. Obviously, we've cut this down now to, correct me if I'm wrong, 74 rentals will be full credit for those. Yep. And will we get credit for three units in the condos? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And in specific answer to you. Okay. Specific answer to your question: If this were approved the way it would be, you'd have another next February. You'd have another year uh, of, of safe harbor. <coughs> okay. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Kind of say. Yeah. Um, Having this in front of us at this point, um, we do need to, to establish the account and the peer review aspects of um, the architectural um, and engineering plan uh, for that. So we need to uh, create the account or, or 
we have an account already, mm -hmm. but the question is, do you have somebody in line uh, that we've used before uh, that we can go to now for this we portion of it? We do for traffic, I believe. I know, that's still yeah. coming up. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, uh, may I ask a question? Uh, I know in the past, um, you know, the, the town, the town has um, uh, some very um, uh, uh, thoughtful and capable people on their staff, and in particular, Ryan, uh, Ryan Percival, the town engineer, uh, provided the, uh, the engineer's review on um, on a subdivision that we recently did that is perfectly capable of uh, reviewing a, um, a stormwater design. Um, of this nature, it's pretty straightforward. It's by the book, if you will. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there uh, to try to save the clients some money. Gene. Um, yes, I, I think that what we've done in the past is probably what we should consider for the future, which is to have the outside peer review uh, for the civil and for the architectural so that we can uh, afford the board with the expertise of those outside consultants. No disrespect to anyone on staff. We, we all do have a, a good staff and a, a lot of talent, but I think bringing someone from the outside in has been very helpful in the past. I, I, uh, I agree with you with regard to the engineering. It's very rare that, that we see an architectural review. Uh, I, I think that is money that could be better spent, you know, with regard to traffic and with regard to engineering. That, that, that's my comment on, on architectural review. We have in the number past the previous 40 B's that we've gone through, uh, it has seemed to pay off uh, in the end for not only the board but for the community uh, that we do get an architectural review. It did help on the last one. Um, and I know even for the 40 S's that uh, the town goes through, we do the same thing, exactly the same thing. So as much as I, I would like to save the developer some money. At the same time, we found a procedure that seems to work well. Um, to get out of that mode would be very difficult, I think, at this point, unless the board uh, feels differently. I don't. I don't hear any. No. no I, I agree with you, John. Okay. Um, so I, th I think uh, at this point, since we're th at this point, Since we've, we've we've gone through the conceptual changes in the in the development, we need now to uh, find a uh, or create. We already have the account, but go out there and and uh, do a uh, same thing we did with the engineering. Uh, create the uh, uh, outline of what needs to be done. Uh, get a get a bid on it and get it in. Um, so I would ask um, for a motion to um, hire a peer reviewer for both the architectural and the civil. So moved. Do we hear a second? Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, take a, I'll take a vote. All in favor? Five zero zero. So we move forward on that. So Gene, you'll take care of that. Your authorizing staff to do that. Mr. Chairman, I would like to make a specific request with regard to the architectural, and that is that we have some say uh, in the scope of that architectural review because I, I don't want to be in a position where we end up with a, an architect who's going to redesign, you know, the whole buildings that, that we've worked out as a result of working with the neighbors and, 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 and working frankly with with uh, with town staff so uh, you know it's one thing for an architect to look at you know whether we've met met code and, and designed the thing uh, in accordance with the law it's another thing if you get an architect on board who's going to say well I I don't like this whole design and he attempts to redesign our whole project which I frankly would have a problem with Ted that has not been the case in the last 
how many. Uh, yeah, I, I've never run into it. It's, it's basically to code is basically what we're uh, That's addressing. That's why I'd like to look at what the scope is. Um, Gene, you want to put a scope? I mean, yeah. if that be the case, the intention here is to move forward. So if 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 you want the the board to look at the scope, um, or you could you could put the scope together for us. Next meeting we have, anyways. Uh, does the board want to see the scope, or does the board want staff to put it together in consultation with the applicant and then get it off to um, peer reviewers? I don't have a problem. I say town government can put it together yeah, okay. and get with the uh, it, it, working with the applicant. Okay, yeah, okay. I think so. We'll save some time. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Okay, then that takes care of the second item on our agenda. Um, the third item on our agenda is to get another issue um, that has come up and was filed with us on the 26th of June, and that was the peer review on the parking. Now, I know that things have changed, um, you might say somewhat dramatically, um, because we've reduced the project uh, in terms of units uh, by about 27% or so. But the fact is that we're talking about traffic that's going to affect whether it's, we're not talking about seven units, we're not talking about 17 units, we're still talking about a sizable number of units, which, I, which I've calculated before, and I may be wrong a little bit of my calculations, but you're almost doubling the neighborhood by the project that you're putting up. So we need to look at the engineering, I'm sorry, we need to look at the traffic uh, study to see exactly where we, we've done. The peer review uh, was done. It has been sent back. Um, all I want to do is to get that on the record tonight. Uh, it gives the board an uh, opportunity to, to, to ask questions of the uh, peer reviewer on the track this evening. Um, and then, depending upon what time we have left, uh, there's a couple of other issues that we have to address, which is one we're going to meet next. But I'd like to get this moving on, so, um, Ready, uh, we'll hear from Green International Affiliates Incorporated, which did our peer review on the uh, traffic. Thank you. Good, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Wing Wong. I'm with Green International Affiliates. Uh, we are the consultant that has performed the peer review for the town. Uh, on this particular project. Also here with me is Jonathan uh, Freeman, who uh, assisted on the review of the, of the review of the um, uh, Obviously, we've heard a lot of changes uh, tonight, um, so I just want to put the disclaimer out there that our review is based on the traffic study that was prepared back in January of this year. Obviously, we no longer 120 units, but I think uh, a lot of comments still apply while some do not anymore, so uh, we'll go through those. Um, we also took a look at the neighborhood responses to the application itself, and we provided responses to, uh, to those as well. Um, so we'll touch upon uh, a few of those. So finally, we prepare our peer review memo at the end of June. And tonight, uh, my intent here is to highlight the uh, key points of the peer review. Uh, not, my intent is not to go through every single little thing, uh, but just uh, the major items. One of the first ones uh, from the uh, neighborhood responses to the application is to expand uh, the study area of uh, this particular project. Uh, in this map here, uh, Lakeville is down here at the bottom. Uh, that's the development here in the uh, purple. The color here, uh, the blue circles, are the study intersections that was included in the original traffic study. 
the red circles are the expanded study areas. Uh, so we took care of the intersection of um, Eden and uh, Green, as well as uh, Beach and Green, um, Green and John, as well as Salem and Eden. And lastly, we took care of the uh, uh, Walker's Brook and General uh, Way intersection there. What we found um, is that when we apply the projected traffic um, to these newly studied intersections, um, we found that in the end, the overall um, traffic performance uh, is not impacted uh, significantly, uh, in fact, very little. Um, traffic performance uh, is measured in level of service, uh, ranges from A to F. A is the best, uh, F is in uh, failing conditions. Um, in each of these uh, new study intersections, the level of service grade relative to existing conditions did not change. Um, so it's, uh, again, very minimal um, changes. Those I'm not sure if you're going to be able to see the, the tables. These were included into our peer review. Um, at the end, basically, again, the, the level of service um, is maintained throughout. Um, one of the things we found in terms of when we did our site distance uh, evaluation, our independent evaluation, um, most of the site distance at all the proposed drivers, again, this is from the previous site plan, uh, they were found to be adequate. There was one spot uh, that we noticed that a fence um, could potentially uh, restrict site distance. Uh, this is looking at um, uh, Lakeville Ave uh, as, we, as we head down here. Um, that little fence there is next to the um, Westmost driveway, I guess if we look at the site plan, it will be next to this driveway right here. Mm -hmm. um, so what we found was that if that fence could be just moved back slightly, that um, it would get the adequate site distance. So it um, uh, should be a small change to uh, improve the area. One of the neighborhood response uh, comments was about uh, crash data and um, a few crash that should have been included in the evaluation uh, by the initial traffic study. And so what we did was what we found is, what we took our review was we noted that there was two crashes that should have included in the review at the John Street intersection in Walker's Brook. Um, and then at the Walker's Brook in general way, there were 15 crashes in a roughly four year span. Um, we recommended that you know the uh, applicants take a look at review of those crash history and include it as part of study uh, evaluation. This area that was highlighted here is part of um, the state's, uh, uh, it's, it's eligible for highway safety improvement programming. It's one of the um, uh, crash clusters in the state. Um, so that's the purple area, and that area is just south of the Walker's Brook intersection of General Lake. There was another comment from the neighborhood responses about the trip generation manual. Um, the applicant or the original study used the ninth, gener the ninth edition of the trip generation. Uh, this manual is used to uh, project uh, traffic that would be expected from uh, a certain type of development. Uh, it's based on uh, research that was done throughout uh, many years and compiled data together uh, to come up with projections. Um, what we did was we used the 10th edition, which is the current and the latest edition, and that was one of the comments from the neighborhood responses. In this particular table, we uh, basically just compare side by side the 9th edition versus the 10th edition, and whether or not there were any differences between the trip generation. Um, what we found was from the AM uh, peak hour and the PM peak hour, the traffic volumes were essentially identical. In fact, um, the 10th edition actually had a slight decrease during the AM and PM peak hour times. The increase, the difference here was really on the um, Saturday peak period time where um, it actually increased by almost 30 cars. But more significantly, the daily um, expected uh, traffic generation between the two days, I'll get you in two versions, is roughly about 450, 470 cars. <coughs> Uh, so I wanted to talk about the Lakeville, uh, Lakeville app at uh, Walker's Brook intersection just a little bit more. Uh, earlier I spoke that in terms of traffic performance, meaning uh, the number of cars entering the intersection and the level of service um, is not impacted greatly by the development. However, um, what we found is that there still is a safety aspect to this particular intersection. Uh, on the graphic map here, Lakeville Ave is coming into your page, but this way. Uh, Walker's Brook is coming up and down the sheet. 
Um, you know, we discussed that from our research, it appears that about 15 crashes within a four year period happens at this, this intersection. There's about another six within a three year period at the Lakeville uh, Ave intersection. Um, and with traffic projected to increase potentially three times uh, as much as today uh, along Lakeville Ave, um, we certainly feel that it's in terms of safety that could be evaluated further to um, see if there's any way to mitigate uh, any potential safety concerns. Uh, we came up with three suggestions, um, possible solutions that could be evaluated further for improvements. Uh, we're not saying to obviously do them, but certainly could warrant additional uh, study. Uh, one of those potential options is to include Lakeville Ave um, into the signal uh, with the general way and Walker's broken intersection, uh, essentially forming almost a, a fourth leg. I know the bank comes down here, but if you were to picture this coming in as a four leg intersection um, being signalized, and that certainly is one way to improve uh, safety. Uh, another possible option, restricting left turns out of Lakeville Ave um, onto Walker's Brook. Uh, certainly, uh, those, who, those of you who live here, I'm sure you're aware that it, taking the left out of here is extremely uh, difficult due to the high volume on Walker's Brook. So that could be a potential option. Again, needs additional uh, evaluation. And sort of a uh, out of the box option, if you will, if we realign um, Lakeville Ave and connect that with John Street and eliminating this particular intersection will reduce some conflict points and sort of send traffic over to John Street. But again, it's just an idea out there that could be evaluated. Um, so something that we suggest that the applicant take a closer look at um, ways to mitigate the added traffic uh, in relation to safety. Other minor recommendations, as discussed, uh, you know, update the trip generation using the 10th edition of, um, of the IT trip generation, um, the latest version of the analysis software. In the end, the results should be similar, um, but certainly always good to use the latest uh, uh, programs. Uh, lastly, uh, in terms of this talk about parking supply, uh, it's really about defining um, uh, if there's any uh, bicycle uh, parking areas, uh, if there's any uh, low emission vehicles or um, uh, charging stations in relation to that, that's really what that's, um, that's about. Lastly, we also reviewed a site plan that was for 120 units. Uh, so obviously a lot of these may not apply anymore, but I'll just quickly go through them. Um, some of the recommendations that we had, uh, for example, could be some of the minor is adding a stop sign to the driveways. Um, install pavement markings at the driveways uh, at those wheelchair ramps. Uh, we talked about the parking down here. Um, could potentially identify a school bus pickup drop off area. And we also noted that the uh, aisle width in the parking lot is just two feet shy of the town's um, uh, bylaw requirements. Um, we also noted the sidewalk width. Um, with the old site plan, it was between buildings two and three that the width um, should be five feet to meet ADA compliance. Uh, and the last thing I think we heard uh, several times was about the loading zone. So um, that's, that was really the highlight of our review. I think some of these still do apply, but again, not having a chance to review the latest site plans, uh, I'm not 100% sure if these are still applicable. So this time, uh, if you have any, any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Hello. Nick, you want to start? <laughs> yeah. I'll start. Uh, I just have a quick question. It's more of uh, helping me comprehend this. Could you could explain in more of like a, a layman's terms why something that's predicted to have three times more traffic generation doesn't change the level of service and the grades don't change? Sure. Um, so when we um, analyze the uh, traffic performance, we focus on the peak hour period. Um, the peak hour time is usually about 10% of the day volume on average. I mean, location varies a little bit in terms of percentage. Um, so even though the site is generating uh, upwards of 600 cars per day, um, if 10% of that's about only 60 cars. Um, so throw that out through the network, um, certain locations it results in uh, very little amount of traffic being added to a certain intersection, and therefore um, the level of service was not impacted in those kinds of cases. Thanks. No questions. 
Sorry. To me, the uh, the main intersections that bother me are obviously the one at General Way and Lakeview, and uh, the other major access egress, which to me is is Salem Street and Eaton Street. But I, uh, there were some men, uh, some people, some neighbors in, on uh, John Street that I think raised an interesting uh, question, and they wrote it up and sent it into us, and that is that there is an awful lot of traffic that comes off of Salem Street down John Street to get access to the shops, the market basket, and things at General Way to avoid going through downtown. Yep. So there is a, a lot of traffic that comes down that way, which is basically north of Pleasant Street on John Street. And I think that's a major access route that hasn't been addressed and probably should be as we try to wrap up this, this traffic study. Those are the three that bother me. Everything else on that chart, frankly, doesn't bother me at all. Uh, uh, particularly with the change in the kind of project that we're talking about. So my thought would be that we need to take a look at Salem, Town John, to General Way. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bob? <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you, John. <clears throat> yeah, concern that I have is if, if the town is going to be looking to bring uh, Lakeview up to town standards, widening that, would this be the time then to look at tying in signals with Lakeview, with General Way, and possibly even having, I know you talked about a left turn lane there, have, maybe having an exclusive left turn lane at that intersection. Uh, you know, at Lakeview, for people to go in that, if it is signalized, I think an exclusive left turn lane would only probably work if it were signalized in the section. Uh, so I, I think the first question, if uh, Lakeville is going to be reconstructed, it certainly seems to make sense to evaluate or not. It would be appropriate to tie it in in terms of signalizing. So that's certainly something that could be looked at. Yeah. Um, in terms of the left turn link into Lakeville, I think no, out of Lake, out of Lakeview, onto onto uh, Walkersbrook Drive. Uh, based on the traffic volumes that we collected and also see what was projected, um, it appears the left turn may not be warranted, um, but. If it is going to be signalized, I guess we might as well do the analysis to see if that yeah. makes sense or not. But the initial look at the volumes there uh, doesn't appear that it's warranted but again. Well, I, you know, well, I noticed you had, had noted, noted uh, you had that was one of your points there that was a possibility for uh, the town to look at was restricting left turns from Lakeview on to Walker's Brook. And that's where I thought if, if we're going to be working that intersection, possibly signalizing it, would it be worth having an exclusive left turn lane there along with a right turn lane? It, it really depends on the results yeah. analysis at that point. Uh, the left turn restriction was really more um, taken into context if, this ex if the intersection is kept as is today without signalizing it, um, taking into account the, the three times more volume on a daily basis um, against the heavy volume that's already a walker's broke that, you know, it's one potential option to, if you restrict it, then you take away that conflict. Yes. Okay, thank you. Well, for myself, I, I have some concerns also. Um, we have four major access routes into the town. Um, we have um, Salem Street. We have Main Street, which is Route 28. Um, we have um, Walker's Brook Drive, which is coming right off of 128 or 95. Um, and then we have the one coming in off of 93, which is uh, all four of them um, seem over the years have been multiplied many times over. Two of those four are going to be impacted here. Whether it's now or whether it's later is not going to make a difference. Uh, whether it, this is, as I said previously, 
whether this is um, 100 units or whether it's only 86 units or whatever the number is, we need to address that intersection. Um, I don't know what would happen if uh, General Way were to improve the number of res uh, businesses that are in there and increase the traffic uh, in there either. But um, I don't have solutions, but I think one definite thing is that it has to be, that intersection has got to be signalized. I don't know who is the person who goes after that. I don't know if that's our own staff members, our engineering department. Um, but to me, it needs to be addressed um, as a major portion of this discussion. Um, Gene. Um, I looked at all of the information over and over again, and um, I think for me, you know, trying to put this in the context of is this going to be exclusively, uh, the residents going to be exclusively using vehicles to get to this site, or will there be alternative forms of transportation that lend themselves? And early on in some of the earlier development review team meetings, we talked about um, the potential for connectivity to the, of this site to the uh, adjacent commercial areas where there is a tremendous amount of parking. And I know it probably sounds um, way out there, but we did talk about uh, the possibility of a pedestrian bridge and connecting the site to um, the rear of um, that commercial area adjacent to it, um, namely the parking lot for Jordan's Furniture. Um, it sounds out there, I, I will admit it, but um, but it just seems like an opportunity, potentially, to consider um, other ways for, for the, these residents to be able to access commercial areas that are directly adjacent, and, and potentially to get down to a, a bus stop or you know, you use other ways of, of uh, trans other forms of transportation. Um, so I'll throw that out there as a kind of a, a, a long shot. And it was mentioned in the peer review report that um, that, that was something we had discussed, and it was also in the um, in the letter that um, the approval letter from the state. Um, that was one of the conditions that they said in the state approval that they wanted this to be looked at. So I just didn't want that to get lost, even though I know it's it, it's kind of a long shot. Um, otherwise, I think um, anytime you talk about traffic and impacts, um, it gets to be very complicated. Um, the town is um, looking at this area as an economic development area, not just Eaton Street, and, but the whole overall New Crossing Road area. Um, and we're gonna be going for some grant money to begin to do some visioning work around this area, um, to think about some of the conversations we've had on economic development and potential for the area. So that all, all comes around to um, how are we gonna deal with this problem that we have on Walkersbrook Drive? And I don't have the answer to that, but I know we, it's something the town needs to deal with. Thank you. Thank you, Gene. Uh, normally, uh, I didn't expect uh, we would be in this good a shape, um, but normally after a peer review uh, has, has uh, come before the board, and unless there are other questions from the board, um, I would give the opportunity to the developer to um, address the concerns that were mentioned here, although I didn't think we were gonna get this far. I do wanna make sure that we reset uh, for the next meeting in a reasonable amount of time. Um, but Ted, are you interested in trying to? I think uh, Jim can do a short uh, response. Go 
Good evening. I'm Tim Hazardian with TEF LLC. Uh, as traffic engineer, I'm going to give a pretty brief response. Uh, on the trip generation, uh, we use the ninth edition of the manual. The tenth edition was coming out as we were doing the study. Uh, that's where we use the uh, the ninth. Uh, and uh, I did recalculate the vehicle trips using the tenth edition for the 86 units. And uh, for uh, all the uh, days and all the peak hours, uh, the number of trips is down uh, versus what was in the impact study. Uh, the um, capacity analysis, uh, we used uh, Synchro 8, which models a 2010 capacity manual. Uh, they're up to Synchro 10, uh, which reflects the 2016, I call it, revision to the capacity manual. Uh, Synchro 8 is still widely in use. Uh, the uh, changes to unsignalized intersections and signalized intersections, we analyze unsignalized intersections, are minimal. Uh, and from examining uh, Green's work and, and uh, my work, it looks like it wouldn't change results significantly. Um, and uh, let's see, What's the, uh, the last number? The last what item is. is the uh, you said it wouldn't change significantly. What is um, the number? Uh, uh, pardon me. Uh, this is not open to public comment. Uh, the uh, the level of service uh, that are reported are, uh, are, are, are similar. Um, and uh, then uh, finally, uh, the issue of uh, what, what to be done about left turns out of Lakeview. First of all, safety in the area. I did a preliminary uh, calculation for the uh, crash rates uh, at Lakeview Avenue turning uh, out onto, uh, onto uh, Walker's Brook. And uh, if you add the two crashes that are outside of the intersection a couple of hundred feet away. Uh, for my preliminary calculations, we're still below the statewide average. Uh, and uh, the intersection of a general way and uh, Walkersburg Drive, I did a preliminary calculation uh, with the 15 crashes over, uh, over the five years. And it looks like they're about at the state average, maybe a little below. Again, preliminary calculations. So as far as at those locations having uh, an out of line crash rate, I didn't see that. Uh, that being said, left turns out of Lakeview are a challenge. It's an existing challenge. Uh, the uh, impacts of the project, uh, if you look at the peak hours, uh, are really not that much in, in two senses of the word. One is the levels of service aren't materially affected. And the other is the absolute number of vehicles being added during the peak hours uh, is, is not a big volume. Um, but it's, it's still something that's out there. The question is, how does it get dealt with? It's an existing condition. The development didn't create it. The development does add a small amount of traffic to it. Uh, uh, any major change in the area, in, in my opinion, uh, should probably not just be viewed in the context of this, this, uh, this project. Uh, some of the uh, ideas, like rerouting traffic uh, and, and uh, putting them out on, uh, putting the traffic in Lakeview uh, onto John Street, that would affect other people. Uh, and. Uh, Signalizing uh, the uh, end of Lakeview Avenue would, uh, would involve considerable cost on top of the uh, cost the developers are already planning to uh, put into rebuilding uh, Lakeview Avenue itself. Uh, and um, the analysis uh, might affect other elements of Walkersburg Drive. Uh, putting in that signal for that phase isn't necessarily, a, for that approach isn't necessarily as simple as it sounds. Uh, they'd have to add another signal phase uh, to uh, the intersection, uh, and the intersection would become a long intersection. It would be a long distance between uh, the Lakeview Avenue stop, stop line and the, uh, the stop line at General Way. And uh, I don't think that's mine. Uh, and it is mine. I'm sorry. I thought I killed the volume on that. Um, so it's not necessarily a, a simple slam dunk design. Now, uh, there was some talk about uh, going for grant money in relation to uh, the uh, economic development uh, plans in the area. Maybe, maybe the, the developer has offered to make a contribution to that effort. Uh, and maybe it could be a, a joint effort where the developer kind of sees things uh, and, uh, and then things get looked at in a more comprehensive manner, not just looking at the impacts of, of this uh, one development. So those are my, my my main comments. I have some other responses, but I don't want to I don't want to take all night with them and then mine. It wouldn't affect anything of significance. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ted, did you want to uh, talk a little bit about 
from the development team now. Well, with regard to traffic, uh, what I was going to suggest is that uh, we encourage the, the two experts to talk with one another uh, to attempt to narrow the issues uh, for your consideration. And in addition to that, I would suggest that we do a workshop uh, similar to what we did to arrive at this design uh, in which we would have the two experts, your peer review and, and Kim, uh, sit down. Uh, we would invite uh, town staff, of course, to participate as they did in, in, the, in our earlier discussion. Uh, perhaps uh, if that is your practice to have one member uh, of the ZBA attend, uh, you know, to monitor or listen to that. You could do that without violating the open meeting law, in, in my opinion. Um, and then try to narrow these issues for the next meeting of the ZBA, and then at that meeting we could focus in, perhaps devote 75% of that meeting to a discussion of, of traffic. In addition to that, we'd respond to these other issues that have been brought up that, uh, you know, the, uh, let's, the, let me call them the detail of the plan, but most of that could be spent uh, with regard to traffic, and hopefully as a result of the two consultants meeting and as a result of the workshop, uh, the issues could be narrowed, so then the, the ZBA could give us a sense of direction as to how we're going to approach the problem. That's my suggestion. Thank you, Tim. At this point, uh, we also have to um, address the continuation, as, we, as I said at the very beginning. Um, I don't even, I know that we have a date that's open, and that's the 15th of August. Mm -hmm. I do not think all five board members can be present that night. Um, if we cannot do the 15th, what are the dates are open, I mean? Uh, At, at this particular point, um, I'm, we meet on the first and third Wednesdays of each month. Um, if we have to, we'll meet on, the, on a second or a fourth uh, to, to get this moving. We cannot wait any longer to move forward and get, as, as you listen tonight, you hear a lot of details that are missing. We need those details in the in the public record before we can move forward on some of the other things. And we're only moving on two of them so far. We've got about four more that need to be addressed. And we only have five months left to get this done. So I would ask board members, and then I'll ask uh, the development team. Um, I'm, I'm available pretty much uh, any Wednesday in June, or any Wednesday in June, any Wednesday in August. On that. I know Cy mentioned you'd be out the 15th. Any Cy. Wednesday, but I'm not available on the 15th. Yeah. Eric? I'm open. Nick? Same. Um, so what would be good for the developer, I think, then now? We, I don't know if the 8th would work for him. It might be too soon, or is the 22nd the best? We're looking at uh, two well, days. We, we, we definitely want every member present. So, yeah. Oh, absolutely. So that... Uh, uh, that rules out the 15. Uh, Kim, you're going to be out of the country when? I, I come back uh, the night of the 7th. Okay. So how about Wednesday the, uh, the 22nd of August? Uh, do we have availability? Mm -hmm. have the, there's a docket. You have the docket with the dates? Um, yeah. Well, uh, 22nd would be a... It doesn't list it as a, as a date that's possible, right. but I don't know what other boards are meeting that night. Conservation Commission. Conservation on the 22nd. About the 29th. So what conservation? Is this available? They're not meeting here, are they? Well, well there are people that go to both meetings, so that's the problem. Okay. Um... 
And if we're doing the 29th, September 5th is available as a regular date, so at that point. Well, then the difference between the 29th and the 5th is? It's the minor. So. The 29th, I have a conflict. I, I have two matters before the Hornfield Planning Board. I have a conflict also on the 29th. Yeah, but you have to be on a day other than Wednesday. Uh, we have other commitments to other uh, boards. Uh, That's yeah, what makes it difficult. Um, I hate to put it off until the fifth, but. There's no reason if, if we put it off till the fifth after that, if we have to accelerate meetings, you know, there's no reason why we can't have two, you know, two in one month. That's right. Well, we're balancing on Wednesdays between us and conservation. So a, a second and a fourth is not going to work on a Wednesday as we have done in the past, kind of rarely, uh, we'll meet on a different day if that day is done far enough in advance and, you, and the staff is available on that particular day. But um, if the fifth is the earliest, then we'll plan on the, and I think we'll plan on the fifth. Generally. What about a Thursday? We, we typically don't have board meetings on Thursday nights. I know. That's the other option. To go to we work never work. had a problem when we meet when we met on Thursdays. <laughs> 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 but we presented staff with major problems yeah. <laughs> that they had to wait almost a half a week to find out what happened. Uh, so um, that's another if you wanted to look at like Thursday the twenty third, that could get it a little bit that's sooner. Fine. Not a problem for me. It's fun. Thursday the 23rd. Okay. How about the 23rd, Ted? A Thursday. 23rd of August. It works for us. I have a conflict on that day. There's a conflict. How about Thursday the 16th? <laughs> it's not easy. <laughs> Thursday the 16th? How about the 16th? It's another Thursday the 16th. Oh, well, I have gone that entire week. Oh, that's right. That's right. Oh, okay. I've yeah. disappeared from New York. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was the 22nd. Yeah. So then the 22nd or the 5th, John? I think we're, I think we're back to the 5th of yeah. September. What about the 22nd? I know that's not ideal because conservation meets that night, but if we're tight for time, can't do it the 22nd. 22nd's fine with the board, I think. Yes. I'm all that week. Oh, okay. <laughs> August is tough. It looks like everybody's available on the fifth. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so if everybody's available on I, I have a few other things before we settle on that. Fifth is still okay? Okay. Um, this evening we also uh, authorized um, peer review. Um, but we also need um, money in the account to um, address peer review. Do you want to address that, Chris? Sure, so earlier the board um, authorized staff to go out and arrange for peer reviewers to come on, but we'll also need we'll also need the applicant to deposit uh, peer review funds into the town's account. So we'll uh, prepare scopes, share them with the applicant, but I just wanted to leave here with the understanding that before we meet again, we'll have peer reviewers up and running with um, funds provided by the applicant uh, into the town's 53G account. If we can all agree to that right now. Again, with the assumption that we'll share uh, the scopes that we get from the consultants we select, uh, and we will review the architectural scope with with Ted. And, and you would expect, Chris, that 
that that peer review would be on board on the by the sixth? I don't know that we would have it. Um, like ready it. to go by the 6th, but I would certainly hope to have it uh, well in process before we, um, before that, before we're back together on the 5th, so. By, by locking that in, Ted, um, all we're doing is, I mean, we've got enough to keep us busy on the 5th. Right. Um, we need to also look at what the other options are, what the other dates are, and that's what I think we're going to have to work with staff to do. Uh, is just to get some dates out there and um, do a scope of time uh, factors involved and what else we need. Um, we would have all of that. I think we can have all of that ready for the fifth, so we can have a, a plan ready to move yep. on. Okay. Uh, so far, I mean, we've been looking at piecemeal, but now we have a substantial amount of data on the record, public records, yep. so we can move forward. And the next time that we meet on the 5th, um, there'll be, I feel confident that we'll have sufficient time to allow people on the public comment section to address things that they, they have too. It's just that tonight it was just going to be too tight and we don't want to outdo our welcome at the library here. Um, so we can't push that too hard. <laughs> So, By having it on the sixth, we'll get uh, on the we'll fifth. Also, okay. on the fifth, will give us time if the board uh, agrees to it to do this workshop uh, on traffic. Allow us to work with uh, with town staff to set that up. Mm -hmm. uh, try to uh, narrow these traffic issues. Gina, of course. Sure. Okay with you? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Then the last item on the agenda for tonight then will be, um, uh, do I hear a motion to continue the subject matter of this hearing until the 5th of September at 7 o'clock, this location? Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, before we do that, would you consider opening the floor to public comment for a few comments? You said we had it until about 9.45. If there's something particular to the traffic I would like to before the experts get together and uh, is presented to the board next year? Um, I have some reservations about doing that now. We've lost some people who were here hoping to make comment, um, public comment. If, you, if you're if you really concerned about something, what I'd ask you to do Seconds. would be to put it in writing and send it into mm -hmm. staff. Yeah, uh, we can do the same thing. Uh, we've been doing this all along. Yeah. Or you can use the web page to do the same thing. Yeah. I would suggest you do it in writing so that we have it. Yep. Okay. Which members of us? And talk with the neighborhood group. Pardon me? How do the rest of us be concerned? Oh, yes. I mean, any, any, we haven't shut anybody off. It's just that tonight was going to be so, so tight that I did not want to jeopardize um, what we were doing with the library. Um, I know there's substantial public comment, especially on the traffic. Ten minutes is not going to do it, and I'm not going to shut people down. So well, rather, as long as the first meeting, we weren't able to have public comment. Yes, you did. It's been no the first meeting. We did. Um, I wasn't my schedule. It will meet the other meetings. There's a number of things that have been discussed. There were things that were brought up today. You have public comment at the very outset of the meeting. There are a number of substance of things that were discussed. So there is limiting the public comment and you went out of order for what would typically be uh, addressed. So I'll do the written response, but just please be aware it's not been uh, open for the comments, which is I'd like to say. Um. I'll take that into consideration. I also take into consideration that we had um, people in the neighborhood who put a very conscientious um, projection together that did workshops with the developer. And I'm grateful for all the, the cooperation that's occurred, but it has been limited in these meetings. Okay. I'll take that into consideration. Then. As I said, I, I don't expect that this will happen again. Um, it's just that I just don't want to open something up and not be able to close it down and run out of our time. The with comments them. If we put on the website. Yes. Any emails we get. Anything that, that comes in, as, as Jean said, will go up on the website. 
and in the future the comments section will be increased in time so I'll take a motion to uh, continue the subject matter of this hearing until the 5th um, so moved. second second all in favor so we are adjourned until the 5th of September uh, in this room uh, um, this room is subject to...